tonight. It is Mother's Day. I started uh, started the day off with kind of a weird topic in Sunday school. We were talking about complications and, and hard labor, tragedy type stories in the Bible, and that's a terrible thing to talk about on Mother's Day. Uh, but it brought up this subject about how, you know, birth, giving, giving birth to a child is, you know, the, the, t- the pain and the suffering that, that came with that in the Bible that we see that that was actually the curse at the fall. One of the curses that were put on the woman and her suffering would be exceeding sorrowful. And it almost doesn't seem fair sometimes when you see that and you, you know, uh, how, lo- how much a woman just longs to be, uh, have a child and, you know, to be barren would be like a curse. And so uh, you see this heart of Hannah when you read this story and how she's, she's just bitter and she's, she's very sad. She goes up and, and, uh, and man, she goes to the temple, you know, her husband's taking her to the temple and they're doing what they're supposed to do, but she's, she's sorrowful and you're not supposed to eat the sacrifice being sorrowful. Uh, that's another uh, story under the old Testament law, but, uh, she just doesn't even eat because she's like, I can't be eat. I can't, I, I can't eat. I can't be happy. I can't, I can't enjoy this. And so it's just that you just feel really bad for her. And, uh, you know, here she is trying to do right. She's got nothing to show for it. No, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to point out several things from this story, but the thing that I want to point out is, uh, in her life, in Hannah's life, and she's going to be an application here uh, for women in general, but in her life, there's several things that she had that she could sacrifice or offer unto God, just a gift that she could give unto God that, that he would, uh, that he'd be able to take, you know, as her service to him. <clears throat> and, uh, I want to talk about the greatest offering a woman can give the greatest offering a woman can give. And so that's the title of the message, and I hope uh, that it'll make sense as we go along. Okay, Number one, just a woman in general, just, uh, you know, you think about it, she's a girl, she grows up, uh, she's a woman, and sometimes a woman has to be single, right? A woman, you know, for whatever reason, she's single, and you know, that singleness is something that she can offer to the Lord and, and, you know, you know, wait to the conclusion on this, on this topic, but look at first Corinthians seven, first Corinthians seven. Verse 32. We'll come back to the story of Hannah in a minute, but it says, but I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belongeth to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how Uh, she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. And so we understand that Paul, for whatever reason, was single. Uh, Some have speculated. There's really no clear proof, I don't think, in the Bible, but uh, some have speculated that he was possibly married at one point. And maybe his wife died and he decided to remain single after that. Uh, some say that he just was always single. I guess the main reason people don't think that that was the case is because of the fact that he was a Pharisee and Pharisee of the Pharisees and, and uh, studied under Gamaliel, which would have made him part of the Sanhedrin. And there was a rule that they had to be married. This is what I've heard, okay, commentaries, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's really no proof either way that I can tell. But what we know from this verse and from others that he chose to remain single. And he said, because of the fact that I'm single, I don't have to give all my, my time and my effort to the cares of this world to please my wife and all. And I just, re- I just decided to stay uh, single. Now, obviously it's Mother's Day and I'm mostly talking about women right now, but women, I think probably even more than men, I don't know if I could say that or not, but uh, 
I think women more than men probably start at a very young age feeling like they've got to be married. They need somebody to take care of them. They need somebody to, uh, you know, uh, sweep them off their feet, provide for them, care for them and all that. And that's perfectly normal. That's perfectly right. But there comes a time in their life where they say, well, I can't. Right. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe it is just there's nobody out there. You know, there's a lot of good women uh, searching for men and the men just aren't out there. And uh, and so, you know, there's that opportunity for that woman to say, you know what? I'm going to give my singlehood to the Lord. All right. For maybe he'll change his mind later. Maybe something else will happen. But right now I'm going to give my singlehood uh, to the Lord. Look at Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. Now that this is that kind of popular popular passage about the uh, eunuchs, and of course we're talking about women. The text is more talking about men, but the concept is the same. Matthew 19. Look at verse 9. <clears throat> and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with the wife, it is good, it is not good to marry. But he, Jesus, said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were uh, so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were uh, made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs uh, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, I know you could probably look at that and want to get into the detail. What does it mean? What exactly is a eunuch? How are, how are they made? How do they make themselves eunuchs and, and all that? And look, I don't think it's necessary to get into that. The point, I believe, is, is clear. There are some people who are not ever going to get married, you know, for, you know, different reasons. Okay, but one of the reasons that that would happen uh, would be for that person for the kingdom of heaven's sake, you know, and I compare that to uh, 1 Corinthians 7, and I think that's a noble position. That's one that's not very popular, but it's a noble position for a lady or a man to say, I'm going to give my singlehood to the Lord, all right? Easy for me to say I'm married, <laughs> right? But it is something that they could give. Would that not be a great sacrifice to the Lord? I believe that would be a great sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, the, <clears throat> number two, a woman could offer God her loyalty to her husband in a difficult marriage. All right, this happens a lot of times. People get married and it ends up being a very difficult uh, situation. Let's go back to our text here. I know very little about Hannah's life. Uh, we know very little except for what's here in 1 Samuel. <clears throat> we know El Elkanah is her husband. He obviously loves her. He obviously tries to take care of her and, and wants to please her and all that. And so that sounds like a good thing. But how many of you think she's in a difficult marriage? I mean, how about we start with verse 2? And he had two wives. I mean, that's difficult. <laughs> that's, that's messed up already. <laughs> I know there's a, it's not an isolated situation. There's lots of uh, cha uh, places in the Bible where it talks about stories of somebody having uh, more than one wife. Uh, but that's never right, first of all. And second of all, if that is the case, think about all the problems that that causes. Well, story after story, we see where it causes a great problem for there to be two wives in the same house. Are you kidding uh, but uh, this is what we see uh, sometimes. And not only that, but in this situation, you know, there's obviously some uh, mistreatment of, of Hannah by this other, other wife. And in verse 6, it says, Her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord has shut up her womb. And, uh, and, and so it continues to be uh, the case. Uh, we get a little bit of a picture of Elkanah's uh, personality in verse 8. My wife and I like making jokes about this because it's so funny. This is like such a man's way of thinking. It says, uh, Why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? No, you're not, okay? 
<laughs> it's plain and simple. But he thinks he's, hey, don't be mad that you don't have a child. Look, I'm better than 10 sons. But she wants a child and she is in a uh, terrible situation. But I'm getting ahead of myself on that. And that's point three. Okay, he, she's in a situation and a wife could get into a situation where she's in a relationship, not super pleasant, not what she dreamed of, not the fantasy that she hoped it would be. But yet the Bible teaches that a wife in that situation can give unto the Lord that marriage, even if it's not what she thinks is the best. And let me just say, in the process, this kind of goes with my message this morning in Iola, if a person has the right attitude, whatever state they're in, whatever state they're in, they can be content and they can be happy. And God can show himself faithful and say, hey, I will provide you what you need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And God wants to love his children and provide for his children and take care of them. He can give you things that you never imagined he could give you. Okay, uh, Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And there's lots of places in the Bible where... Uh, uh, where we see a similar verse, and Colossians says something similar. And the idea is that wives, while they're submitting to their husbands, right, are doing it as unto the Lord. It's actually the Lord. You realize what a great offering, a great sacrifice they're giving the Lord. Lord, I might not live the pleasant life that I always hope to live, but I'm just going to offer this to you. And because you love me, I'm going to trust you that you will take care of me and give me what I need. And this is what he does. And who knows? Maybe in that situation, a lady's marriage would get better. And uh, maybe they could even have more than they, they ever hoped for. Number three. Sometimes a woman gets married. Husband loves her like this was in the case here. I mean, obviously not a perfect marriage, but... Uh, it could be that they have a good relationship, but the woman just wants a child. I've met a lot of women just, I want a child, they want a child, and they can't help it. And this is very common in the Bible, particularly, maybe a whole lot less so in our society today, uh, where that's not like the most, you know, honoring thing that you could do is just to have a child. But back then, that was the greatest thing that could happen. That was the biggest blessing is that you could have a child. Biggest curse would be to be barren. So the women wanted to, to have children. That should be the case now, I think. I think women should have a desire to be mothers and, uh, and to have ch children to raise as godly seed. And, uh, and so, but we don't see that as much. Look at Genesis chapter 30. I don't understand why some women today don't want children. Maybe it interferes with their career or whatever, but I'm telling you, there's nothing greater in this world that a woman could invest her time in than to loving and caring for, uh, for her children. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1 says, And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. You see, she is so wanted children so badly that she's like, Lord, give me the children. I mean, not Lord, but she was saying uh, to Jacob, give me children or else I die. <clears throat> and some people will do this. I've even known a lot of good Christians. Uh, even remember at Bible college, met a lot of families, loved the Lord. And, and uh, I think their intentions were right, but they wanted children so badly that they're willing to go to great extremes to have children which may or may not have had have been God's will, or maybe it was God's will, but he wanted them to wait. You know, this is uh, uh, something else we talked about uh, this morning, is that there were lots of times in the Bible where uh, people, you know, in fact, the examples that we see over and over again were those who were barren, God wanted to show himself in a miraculous way. So he would allow them to be barren for a long time to where people thought oh, there's no way they could have a child. Uh, maybe even there past the time, you know, that a woman ha can have children. And yet God would show himself miraculous and they would still have a child and God would be glorified in it. Maybe that was God's plan. But some people start freaking out because they don't have what they think that God should be giving them. And people will take themselves to extremes. You know, I've heard stories of people can't get pregnant, and so they start uh, taking these fertility drugs. And I haven't looked extensively into them, but, um, but 
uh, sh just briefly on the way up here, we were going over some stuff uh, online and and thinking about the side effects of the fertility drugs. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that they can do to mess up somebody's body. Uh, but not only that, think about this. Those fertility drugs causes them to have a higher chance of having children. Okay. And this is why sometimes they'll take those drugs and they'll end up having multiple like, uh, you know, quadruplets or whatever you see people that have a whole lot of babies. And this will all come because that fertility drug is making them super fertile is the idea and giving them more chances to become pregnant. So what happens a lot of times is there's also more chances that a baby will be conceived and then it will die. And so there's a lot of basically they're almost like committing abortion inside their womb unknowingly because they want a child. They're willing to do that uh, and harm, harm themselves. And so people do that. And, and, you know, and I'm talking about this one particular case of a woman of women who are barren and they want children. But don't you see where we do that in a lot of areas in life? It's like, we want so badly. We know what God's will should be. <laughs> you know, we know what God should do. So we'll jump to extremes to make it happen. And the case, and, and the problem is sometimes we're causing more problems on, on the way. So we've got to be really careful not to do that. We've got to offer to the Lord the best that we can give them. Okay. And, uh, and a woman can awful offer her singleness to begin with, but should she be able to get married? She can get married and offer that marriage, no matter how the situation is, she can offer that to the Lord. Maybe she gets married, but she can't have children. She can often offer her barrenness to the Lord and serve it. It doesn't have to go to extremes. Okay. Uh, another extreme that ladies will go to that are barren is the surrogate mother. You hear the story here recently about a mom who, uh, an older woman, I don't know how old she was, maybe 50s, upper 50s or something like that. And she decided to be a surrogate, a surrogate mother for her daughter who couldn't have babies, I think. And so she basically would have the, uh, you know, I'm not sure all the techniques that they used to do that, but, uh, but she would actually have the child and carry the child to term in her, in her stomach. And so her, her mother is, the one raising the child and I mean, uh, uh, you know, holding the child during those nine months. And then, you know, to me, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't care the situation. I've heard a lot of stories where that happens. Like somebody will like, Hey, you know what? We'll go ahead and, and I'll be the mother. And then you can, you know, it's a, it's to me, it's weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to me, it's weird. But sometimes people have tried that and they'll do that. And here's what I'm thinking. The woman that carries that baby for nine months is going to feel like that should be my baby. And so then when she has to give it away, can you imagine the emotional uh, detachment? And I just think anything like that where they're thinking, no, 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 God uh, didn't answer my prayer. So I'll take things into my own hands and I will make this situation happen. Could make it worse, could cause a lot of problems, could be a bad situation. How about adoption or foster care? I'm not against people adopting babies. I'm not against people, uh, uh, you know, getting into foster care necessarily. I'll tell you this, there's a lot of dangers. There's a lot of problems that can come from that. I've heard people try to put people on uh, guilt trips and say, if you're going to preach against abortion, well, then you better be willing to adopt somebody. Why? <laughs> well, I don't understand, you know, the reasoning, but they're like, yeah, you're going to preach against abortion. Then you better be able to adopt somebody because, you know, you, that would actually be helping the system. I, I remember some guy, uh, he was a comedian and comedians ought to just tell jokes and not try to be, uh, be, you know, some kind of spiritual guru or something. But it's like, I think everybody ought to uh, adopt one child. If everybody adopted one child, then we wouldn't have any problems in the, in, in the foster cares and everything wouldn't be full. And I'm thinking, like, that's not the way God set things up. That's not the way he designed them. You know, we live in a fallen world and obviously there are bad things that happen out there. But when we take things in our own hands and we try to make things happen, it can it can really cause some serious problems. And I've known of families being destroyed because of the foster care system and adoptions and and all that. And uh, it could be very dangerous. Now, what if a woman just decided to give it to God? You know, God, if you don't want me to have children, I'll use that extra time to serve you and to do things for the church, to do things that you would have me to do that normally I would be spending that time raising the children, which is a wonderful thing for women to do. I think it's the greatest thing a woman could do, but maybe it could be that God didn't allow them to do that. Give that to God. What a great offering. 
God, I'm giving this to you because of the fact that you uh, didn't allow me to have uh, any children. But I feel like one of the greatest offerings a woman could, could give, maybe the greatest offering a woman could give, is that a woman could actually give her child to the Lord. And really that's what I see in this story, is here's a woman who wanted so badly to have a child, and then she finally gets that child, and she says, I'm going to give it back to the Lord. I'm going to give my child to the Lord. And you might think, well, yeah, but she still got to have the child. You know, she still had him up until the time that he was weaned. And then she still got to see him once a year, every year at the temple when she made him a little coat and she brought it to him, you know, once a year in the temple. No, you don't understand. A, a woman wants to have her child and she wants to, to have them with her all the time and to raise them and to, to be there, to care for them. You know, uh, we're already getting to a point where uh, uh, we look at Viviana and say how fast she's grown. And it's not long before she's going to be as old as these people. And you're going to be like, where did all that time go? And, and you think, well, we're going to miss all that time that we have. Can you imagine the moment that your child is born? It's just like, okay, you know what? She had even decided, hey, we're, he's going to take the Nazarite vow. We're not going to cut his hair. We're not going to. And it was just like this, this dedication from the time he was born. Then we're going to wean him. Then we're going to drop him off with Eli. Not really the greatest role model, <laughs> you know, and definitely you better keep him away from the from those uh, uh, reprobate uh, sons of his. OK, but he uh, she decides I'm going to give him to the Lord. He's going to be in the temple. He's going to be trained to be a minister uh, in the temple and to be a servant of the Lord. And I'm going to give my child to the Lord. Of course, this is what Hannah does. Look back at our at our text. 1 Samuel. She comes back to him at verse 26. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, what I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he, wor and he worshiped the Lord there. You know, it kind of makes me think about, uh, it kind of makes me think about if somebody, have you ever heard someone say, like, if God would just give me a million dollars, <laughs> you know, God would just give me a million dollars, I would give it all away. Like, I would help this church out and that church out, and I, I, was, I would feed people, and I would do all these great things. And it's like, number one, no, you probably wouldn't. <laughs> Because usually the people that end up with the wealth, you know, they're the ones that it's harder for them to let go of it because of the fact that, you know, they start getting attached to things and the money buys things and then they got to have money to keep up with the things and all that. And it's really hard for them to let them go. So most of the time when people are like, oh, well, if I had a million dollars, I'd give it all away. Well, you're only saying that now because you don't have a million dollars. <laughs> okay. But can you imagine this woman who doesn't have a child and she's like, all right, God, if you give me the child, I'll give the child back to you. Now, God knows her heart. That's the fortunate part of it is that she was sincere. But many of us would think that we would be willing to do that. But then whenever we get the child, it's like, no, I don't want to give, I don't want to give them away. Now, none of us are going to take our child and drop them off at the church and say, here, Pastor Rocky, just, you know, use them however you want to, <laughs> want to use them. I, I would, I would decline that. Okay. I'm just telling you right now. <clears throat> but you know, you should, we all should. Whatever God gives us, whether it be money, whether it be uh, our marriage, whether it be our children or whatever, we should all say, God, everything in this world is yours to begin with. And when you give it to me, I'm going to give it back to you. And so a woman very attached to even her own children, one of the greatest relationships and bonds that there can be as a, wo as a woman and her child, for that woman to say, I'm going to give you my child, Lord, what does that mean? Well, it could mean that that woman has to put away some things that she would rather do and spend that time instead making sure that her children grow up godly and they're not involved in those things that the, that the mother you know, would like to do. She might have to make some sacrifices. She may, may, may make some changes in her life so that she's setting the example for the kids. She might have to be willing to part with her kids if they go into the ministry or something like that. If they don't do all the things that they fantasize that their kids would do one day. Uh, you know, sometimes that's hard. You know, the, you know, my parents, 
my parents weren't like this and and uh, you wouldn't think that that many would be but I've heard a lot of stories remember even especially in Bible college because all these people went there into the ministry and I heard story after story where parents would almost disown their kids like if you're throwing away your whole life and you're going to Bible college to be in the ministry like <laughs> you don't even want a part of that I'm not going to help you I'm not going to do anything because you're throwing your life away because what they wanted was their kids to go and be a doctor or a lawyer or some kind of you know something in the world's eyes was would have that had a, a great value right but how much better would it be to say God you know what I don't care if they never make any money, if they, you know, never have any fame, if they, they don't do anything that I think that they should do, but they serve you, uh, that's all I want. And you give your child to the Lord and say, Lord, you can have this child. Notice the word uh, lent there at the end. It says, therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. Now, at first you might look at that. I remember first time I ever read that thinking, well, to lend something means they're going to give it back to you after a time, right? Well, that's because that's how we use the word now, okay? But back then in the 1600s, 1500s, before that, uh, that's not what the word meant. The word meant basically to give something as a gift. Now, the word would sometimes be used to be able to give something and with the chance of getting it back, uh, but the original word was primarily just a gift to give, to lend. I'm lending it to you. I'm giving to you. Okay. Now you say, well, what about, you know, the kind of idea of giving something uh, like a loan, like today we would go to the bank and take out a loan or whatever. They would charge you interest or whatever. Is how, how was that word used? Well, here's what they would say. They would say uh, to make a loan with usury. Okay, that's what the Bible means when it's talking about that kind of a loan, a loan with usury. Okay, in other words, I'll give you this loan, but it's for the purpose of me making a profit. And so I'm going to not only give you the loan, but I'm going to charge you interest, right, as you <laughs> try to get it paid back so that I can actually make a profit off of it. And that's what that, that's the other term that you hear in the Bible on a loan with usury. But here she's not saying that she's expecting to get them back. In fact, if anything, God gives us children on loan, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, the way we use the word loan today, temporarily, right? To, to raise them and take care of them and be good stewards of the property that he's given us so that we can give them back to him. But here in this situation, she's giving him to God, not expecting anything back. <clears throat> Look at chapter two. So I think that's the greatest offering a woman can give is her own children. I mean, that's what a mother, that's what motherhood's all about, is that, that relationship with the children and being able to take care of them and raise them. But here uh, she gives the greatest sacrifice. She finally gets the child and gives them right back to God. But look what God does for her. Chapter 2, verse 18. All right, let me see here. Uh, yeah, okay, 18. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah the, uh, and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto uh, their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child, Samuel, grew before the Lord. So six uh, children all together, right? Samuel, three sons, two daughters. And, uh, and God decided to give her children after all. He opened up the womb, allowed her to be able to have children after Samuel. And, you don't, and I often wonder, like, would God have done that had she had the heart that she did and was willing to give, uh, to give Samuel back to him? But here's the thing. And this is the conclusion I want to give. This is certainly all up to God. I'm not saying that this will necessarily happen in every situation. Uh, it's all up to God. But, but, but consider this, if you would. Sometimes, ladies, if you're willing to give up your singlehood uh, and, and give it to God, He'll decide, you know what, I'm going to bless you with a husband. Uh, really, I've heard that a lot of stories. Uh, Valerie and and uh, and I both kind of were in that situation. We were we were fairly young. It's not like we were old or anything, but we were fairly young and was like, you know what? I'm not even going to look for 
a spouse or anything. I'm just going to serve the Lord. And it was at that time where God put us together and, uh, and things began to happen. And it was like, you know, I wonder if people would just step away from looking and say, God, I'm just going to put it in your hands and I'm going to serve you. I'm going to give you my singlehood. Perhaps he'd bless them with the spouse. Sometimes if you're willing to give God your loyalty to your spouse, despite the difficulty in marriage or even, uh, or even the difficulty in barrenness and not being able to have children, he'll end up blessing you with a child. You know, a lot of those cases uh, that I knew at Bible college and elsewhere where people uh, decided to go take the, the fertility drugs or to go, you know, uh, adopt or, or whatever, it was like just right around the corner. If they would have waited just a little bit longer, they end up having a child of their own, <laughs> right? And so and it seems kind of uh, contradictory because it's like if you would have just waited, if you would have kept the, uh, uh, you know, following the Lord and serving Him, He maybe would have blessed you with that. Sometimes if you're willing to give God your children, He'll bless you with multiple children and other blessings. And I hope that makes sense that when we give to the Lord, the greatest thing we can think, just if we always think in terms of, I just want to give my best to the master. I just want to give the best that I have to give. And whatever state that we're in, we're just content. We say, God, I'm going to serve you with what you give me. Sometimes he will decide to give us more. But even if he doesn't, he will bless us for the fact that we are making that offering to him. And he will, uh, he will, riches in heaven a hundredfold, right? For the sacrifices and the things that we give up on this earth. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to seek to, uh, to serve you with our life and to give back to you those things uh, which you give us and to offer them, Lord, the things that are most important to us, be willing to give those up and give them to you. And Lord, uh, we know that you know what's best for our lives and we know what will bring you the most glory. And so I pray that you'll just help us to forever remember that in our minds, that you know what's best and that we would give that to you. I pray that you will uh, help each of us uh, in here to make that decision and, uh, and bless according to your will. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.